Longtime Dallas viewers are no strangers to Ewing vs. Ewing battles, but usually they come in the form of the boys scheming against one another or just cutting through all the BS and punching each other in the face. This time, though, it's a battle of the heavyweights, as Jock and Miss Ellie are about to bring a slab full of beef. Uh -huh. Donna Culver begs Miss Ellie to reconsider divorce, but Ellie is resolute. Jock is equally stubborn as he tells Bobby to stop jacking around and vote for the Takapa deal. Bobby, trying to explain to him that ethics, rules, and impartiality are important parts of being a senator, only to have Jock treat Bobby's Senate position like an after-school delivery job at the grocery store, is just peak Jock Ewing. You're still my son, whichever place you're working at. I'm not trying to influence you. I'm telling you what I want you to do. Jock does soften when Bobby offers him a way out while saving face. Miss Ellie's lawyer, Lincoln, is played by the great John Randolph, Randolph starred in some of the all-time great films, including All the President's Men, Heaven Can Wait, Prissy's Honor, and two of the Planet of the Apes sequels. In spite of a long career of excellent supporting performances, Randolph's career is mostly marked by misfortune and tragedy. Born Emmanuel Cohen in 1915, he adopted the stage name John Randolph, presumably so that he could have a career at a time when anti-Semitism was the norm. In the 1940s, he enrolled in the Stella Adler School for Acting, where he met his wife, Sarah Cunningham. As a child of Polish and Romanian immigrants, Randolph was virulently anti-fascist, which led him to social democratic circles. In 1955, Randolph and his wife were called before the House Un-American Activities Committee, chaired by Joseph McCarthy. And, after refusing to testify to the committee, both Randolph and Cunningham were blacklisted from Hollywood for nearly a decade. It wasn't until the mid-1960s, when the Red Scare fever started to break, that Randolph started finding roles again. By the 1980s, Randolph had settled into the genial dad role, playing dads on Family Ties, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, and most unnotably, Seinfeld. I say unnotably because Randolph's turn as Frank Costanza was infamously wiped and reshot when Jerry Stiller took over the character. In fairness, while Randolph turned in a number of great performances over his career, I can't actually imagine him being able to carry the Festivus episode. Randolph faced further tragedy in 1986 when his wife Sarah collapsed during the 1986 Academy Awards ceremony and died of an asthma attack. And with the tight-knit acting community what it is, we've actually seen Cunningham before in this very series, as Cliff and Pam's put upon Aunt Maggie. It's not surprising that former blacklisted actors look to one another for support in the aftermath of McCarthyism. In fact, Randolph and Cunningham might owe their roles on Dallas to another famous actor blacklisted as a communist sympathizer. Barbara Bel Geddes. Anyway, despite Lincoln's pleas for reconciliation, Comrade Ellie is adamant that she wants to kick Jock right in the means of production. Over at Westar Oil, Dave Stratton agrees to be Jeremy Wendell's confederate in a war between J.R. Ewing and Cliff Barnes. It's clear that Jeremy wants to pit them against one another, which is roughly like trying to shoot a man when he's already jumped off a building. Like, I appreciate the sentiment, but it looks like they can take care of this themselves. Speaking of, JR gets an accounting of how much Ewing oil is worth. His accountant, who went to the Bobby Ewing School of Business, Hell, there are other banks. thinks that JR is trying to sell the company. You know who seems to have a problem with that? John Ross, who senses a great disturbance in the inheritance force. This forces Sue Ellen to call off her usual hookup with Clint Ogden. Pam, ever the innovator, decides to work from home, 40 years before that became a regular thing. I didn't feel like working, so I just drove around all day. She notices Sue Ellen is out of sorts, and Sue Ellen makes the mistake of mentioning John Ross's health. Pamela immediately goes into mama bear mode, so I guess old habits die hard. And it's a bit of a precursor to the next season. Ellie tells them that she's planning a divorce. This causes the three younger Ewing wives to project their own relationship issues on Ellie and Jock. Pamela can't fathom a world where Jock and Ellie aren't married. Sue Ellen, though, can't believe Ellie hung in there this long given how selfish Ewing men can be. Donna tells her that Ray is different, but then talk turns to what JR is gonna do if Ewing oil is broken up. The penis is mightier than the attorney-client privilege, so Lincoln comes to JR to tell him to intervene with Jock and Ellie. JR's first call is to Jeremy Wendell, though, to start the Ewing oil sale to West Star. Priorities, people. Mention Lucy makeup, but the piece is almost immediately broken up 
when Lucy's car arrives to take her to the shoot. Dave Stratton shows up at Ewing Oil to offer his services to JR. The plan is that Dave will feed Cliff useless information, and Cliff will share what he knows about JR's role in the Southeast Asia scandal. In one of those quirky, Dallas is such a small town moments, Cliff winds up schmoozing some of Dave Stratton's lovely ladies at the same restaurant where Pamela and Rebecca are catching up. Pamela can't wait to meet her well-adjusted, very sane, and highly stable sister, Catherine. Cliff, who you'll remember met Rebecca last episode, spots her and Pamela together and starts fuming. Leslie Stewart puts a little squeeze on JR, getting him to sign off on a beautiful new penthouse for her and all her new high-end Dallas clients. She experiences a brief lapse in ethics by kissing a married man, only to have that broken up by Luella. At Ogden Industries, whose corporate sign was absolutely not spray-painted by the little rascals, Clint gives Sue Ellen the tour. In what looks like the back of a radio shack, half a dozen men are playing with knobs and gears. Clint explains that their new chip can hold up to one and a quarter kilobytes. That's over a page of Microsoft Word text. The applications are limitless. I don't understand. He also says that it's all for Sue Ellen and that he plans to divorce his wife for her. Sue Ellen is cool to the idea as she just wants to have an affair. This is some good evolution for Sue Ellen as she grew more discontent with JR in season two, leading to an ill-advised affair with Cliff Barnes. But when the time came, Cliff tossed her aside in favor of his Office of Land Management job. And then when she found a man who really did want her and she was willing to leave JR for him, he died. Or so she thought at the time. So one can understand why she doesn't want to take the plunge with a guy who's not even divorced yet. Jeremy and JR come to an agreement on the Ewing Oil deal. Ewing Oil gets to continue operating under the West Tower umbrella, with JR staying on as president. And JR becomes a board member at West Star. Pretty sweet deal for John Ross Jr., actually. The only thing holding it up is that it needs the signature of Chuck Ewing. And Jeremy also needs to be able to tell his board of directors that the deal is ironclad. Jeremy, trust me. Leslie returns home to find her ex-husband waiting for her. They have a genial relationship, but Leslie does confirm that she's using JR to get her consulting business up and running, and perhaps get a nice divorce settlement. We are reminded again that she likes to record important conversations. Cliff storms in and tells Pamela to stop meeting with Rebecca. He thinks that she's a con artist after money. Pamela, ever the hothead when it comes to righteous indignation, lets it spill that Rebecca is their mother. The time comes for the big decision on the Takaba project, so of course all the major players are at the Senate hearing. Bobby, ever the showman, asks to give his presentation in front of the class instead of showing it to the Senate first, or to his father, or to his mother. Bobby's proposal is that he's purchased a parcel of land that's already being developed, and he's willing to swap it for the Takapa wetlands, and then donate Takapa to the state of Texas for preservation. Setting aside ethical concerns, Bobby's plan to buy the land right next to Takapa makes Jock and Punk's outfit look pretty stupid. Why wouldn't they have just scouted the land in the first place? It would have saved them hundreds of thousands of dollars in a protracted fight. I get that accepting Ray into the group drops the average IQ considerably, but you'd think one of them would have thought of that before Bobby did. At any rate, it solves the Takapa problem, but not the Jock and Ellie problem. Ellie is still hell-bent on divorce. Everyone is confused about Ellie's continued intransigence. Pam is so shaken that she turns into Sue Ellen. Well, I don't understand. Cliff, who generally is the saddest sack of doorknobs this side of Biff Lohman, has the good fortune to be finishing up his meeting with Dave Stratton when Afton Cooper recognizes him and sits with him for a drink. This seems like it's a one-off, but it will actually be a drink that changes the entire trajectory of the show. Someone who is not lucky is JR, who calls his daddy to come sign the West Star deal, but that old chucklehead Ray Krebs forgot the Takapa maps back at his house, so they'll have to go back and get them before flying down to Takapa. Jock's not gonna have any time for Ewing Oil business. Can't do it, JR. Oh, but it turns out it was all a ruse. Ray didn't forget the maps at all. He and Donna were just using that as an excuse to get Jock and Ellie together so that they could fight it out of their system. Donna is kind enough to give Ray half the credit for the plan, but I mean, come on. Okay, that's pretty harsh. Ray actually does figure out what's been bothering Ellie this whole time. It's not about Takapa at all. That's just a proxy fight about what's really bothering her. Well, Mama, I know how you've always felt about Southport. Now that uh, Ray is a Ewing, I can stay in California and know that everything here is fine. Now that Ray is a Ewing and can tend to the land that's part of his birthright, 
Gary will never be coming back. And when you add that to how neglectful Jock was of Gary, and how he embraced Ray like a son even before they knew about Ray's paternity, Ellie just became a pressure cooker of rage and pain that had no outlet. This is why you don't suppress your feelings, folks. Anyway, Ray has what is probably his shining moment in the series, as he offers to give up all the Ewing money, land, and inheritance, because it's just not worth it if it comes between Jock and Ellie. And thus, Ray proves to Ellen and Ellie wrong. Unfortunately, love doesn't count for much with Ewing men. Ray isn't like that. But that was before he found out he had Ewing blood in him. Sooner or later you find out that your marriage takes a back seat to their, their great need to prove themselves. There is a Ewing who is willing to put family in love over money and power. Ellie gets a tremendous monologue about how she couldn't admit that Gary just didn't like being at South Fork, so she took it out on Ray and Jock. She tells Ray that she accepts him as a Ewing, and she wants him to stay. And we're out. I think the best way to look at this episode is from the inside out, from the emotional core to everything else that was going on. That final scene is heartrending, made all the more pitiful by Barbara Belgetti's tearful performance and Steve Canale's overwhelmed look of gratitude. The thing is, Ellie's not wrong to be upset. Jock did father a child with the woman he cheated on Ellie with. And while they reconciled the affair years ago, the revelation that there will always be a remnant of that affair has to open old wounds. I wonder if that will become relevant over the next two episodes. I love that Ray finds a way to break through Ellie's tough exterior by doing the most Gary Ewing thing of all time, giving up the Ewing legacy and all the power that comes with it in order to save his family. Well, tell me again the name of this place. Knott's Landing. It's not often that Ellie is positioned as the morally wrong one in the series, so this is somewhat refreshing, even if the audience understands where she's coming from. Ellie's always had a blind spot where Gary is concerned, and regular watchers of Knott's Landing, check it out on Patreon right now, know that Gary can be just as craven and selfish as JR. This is a rare moment of clarity for Ellie, who sees a sliver of Gary in Ray, and sees Gary for who he really is, a second banana car salesman in Reseda. He's neither the titan of industry that Jock respects, nor the man of the land that she was hoping for. None of which is Ray's fault. Bobby's land swap scheme, which is an attempt to solve the surface problem, doesn't really pass the smell test, but Takapa was mostly a MacGuffin at this point anyway, so it's fine. I am Takapa. I'm glad he got to show his PowerPoint, since he worked so hard on it the night before. Thankfully, the writers are winding down the less interesting relationships on the show, or just putting them on the back burner and ignoring them altogether. So Ellen and Clint are on the outs here, with Clint telling her he needs more, and yeah, it's gotta suck that he pined for her for decades only to marry his consolation prize a few months before realizing that Sue Ellen might be available again. But it mostly sucks for his wife, who is not only runner-up, but she's married to the world's most boring tech bro. Speaking of a sleeve of saltines that accidentally left the factory unsalted, Mitch and Lucy's tiff over Lucy having a job was front and center for the past few episodes, and here they get one scene to remind you that they're characters on this show, and then we move on to something interesting. It's like the writers realize mid-story arc that they're focusing on the wrong Cooper sibling. And yes, it is historically significant that Afton sits down for that drink with Cliff Barnes. Cliff is about to undergo a massive character overhaul in the last few episodes of the season, and Afton is a big part of that. But we'll get to that later. The other historical moment is the deal between JR and Jeremy Wendell. Wendell is a rarity in Dallas, a businessman who neither licks JR's boots nor tries to shoot him. He acknowledges that JR has power, but he barely pays him any mind because, to him, JR is small time. For now. Of course, with the reconciliation, the deal to sell Ewing oil is about to fall through. Which isn't really a spoiler if you think about what the deal was contingent upon. That means JR makes a powerful enemy here, as Wendell never forgets the egg on his face. That leads us to the final piece, which is that this episode, for all intents and purposes, is Jim Davis's last episode. Jock appears briefly in the back of a car in the next episode as he and Ellie speed off to their second honeymoon. But this is the last episode of note. Davis would die of cancer a little over three weeks after the air date of this episode. And as many commenters have pointed out in previous videos, he was noticeably struggling on camera with bloating, fatigue, and a number of other health issues. I would argue that Dallas was never the same show without him, which is the type of bromide you hear whenever any actor leaves a show. But in this case, it literally wasn't the same show. 
The entire premise was, like Succession, based around who was worthy enough to take the throne of Ewing Oil. But ultimately, it was just a stand-in for Jock's love. JR's driving force, through all the conniving and the womanizing, was to gain the respect of his father. Which, because Jock was always cold and distant, seemed just out of reach. Watching this back, every JR accomplishment is cut with some sort of admonishment for his methods, a reason why Bobby's accomplishment is better, or a criticism about how he should treat his wife better. I'm not saying all those things aren't true, but you can understand how it must be maddening for JR to never fully feel respected. Danny, I've always tried to please you, and always tried to be the man you wanted me to become. What else do you want from me? And for Bobby, it's almost always a fight for his daddy's soul. He knows Jock has done wrong, but he usually looks the other way because he buys into the idea that, well, everyone in business is a bit of a bastard. But Bobby also believes it doesn't have to be that way, and if he could just get Jock to see that, maybe Jock would be somewhat redeemed. It's why he threw in the towel mid-season after JR undercut him. After a while, the deals became more important than the people. Now, with Jock gone, JR will never get his respect, and Bobby will never see him fully redeemed. The series' entire reason for being is forced to shift, but we'll see how the writers deal with that in future episodes. For right now, come for the ending of Takapa, but stay for the Tinder family drama. Thankfully, I think I can get out of this season without having an emotional breakdown, just as long as there are no more tearful mother-son reunions. <laughs>